participating in an inquiry exercise in class. Uh, to update you, it turns out that Sprittany blew up 0.08% on the breathalyzer test, and when she was stopped um, by police, the value reflected her blood alcohol concentration. Now, um, now uh, at the scene, her uh, attorney said that he was very suspect of the validity of the breathalyzer test given to his client, and so was challenging, the teacher is challenging uh, those students who are discussing this news, uh, which presumably is posted all over the internet uh, about Sprittany, to uh, find out the facts and see if they could actually uh, create a defensible argument uh, to, um, about the, breath, the accuracy of the breathalyzer test as uh, described here. So with that in mind, uh, those of you who tackled these questions, let's, let's move right along. The first couple are, are actually just review of very basic principles. So, oh, and I did want to say as we were going through this, so um, the idea is that uh, in a standard course of study, we try to just pull out some very basic um, uh, principles that we think the students, you're probably already teaching these in your classroom, and that we think the students um, need, need to understand. and. So in a standard course of study, the learning objectives for this module would include things such as understanding the path of circulation in the body, which we talked about a bit last week, as well as um, diffusion and other mechanisms um, for transport of molecules in the body, uh, including active versus passive, the basis of volatility of molecules, as well as redox equations. And we'll spend a little time tonight also talking about equilibrium and sneak in some math where we use ratios in scientific calculations. Moving forward, here we are again with circulation man or woman, genderless <laughs> circulation person. So in this first question, um, we're just asking that, um, that the path of alcohol be diagrammed um, from an entry site at the gut. And just as review from last week, we said that that would have to pass through the stomach and then the liver and continue on in the venous circulation to the right side of the heart, go back to the lungs. And here in the lungs is where uh, the vaporization of alcohol will take place. And that, of course, is what we're talking about tonight in the breathalyzer test. Once the um, deoxygenated blood goes through the lungs, of course, then it goes right back to the left side of the heart and continues to be pumped out to all the remaining organs in the body. And ethanol that is still in the body at this point continues on in this circulation pathway. And every time it re-enters the stomach and the liver, as we talked about last week, there'll be a certain amount of metabolism that happens. And as it goes back to the lungs, again, a certain amount of exhalation with about 10% of the total amount that you ingest um, at a maximum being eliminated through the lungs as a vapor. So if there are not any questions about that first, uh, that first topic in the handout, we'll just move along to the next um, Can concept. Can I add something to somebody? I have a really good um, inquiry-based question that you might ask your kids if they were drawing something like this. And you know, we took a few liberties when we drew this with the art, but it's not actually totally right. And I wonder if any of you might have some astute students that would figure out what's not quite right about this uh, scenario with the, the little circuitry diagram. Obviously, we left out a lot of details, but thinking about the alcohol going around the circulation several times, in its lifetime throughout the body. What, what's not quite right there? Yes, yeah, it's, tr it's true. So the blood stream does come from the intestines as well. I think that was kind of a, just a general arrow there coming from the gut. But do you see at the bottom where it says rest of body? So you have to make an assumption that that means all the organs. So in fact, as the alcohol goes around the body and it comes out of the, the left side of the heart, um, maybe you can point to that, left side of the heart, um, it, it does come back into the arterial system and it, it will go straight to the liver. So you see, you, we don't have a path straight to the liver from the, the heart, you see that? 
Instead, we have a box at the bottom that says rest of body. That means all your internal organs. Does everybody see that? Yes. So yeah. if you use the graphic like this from the modules, this is a great opportunity for you to stop and ask some of your kids to think a little bit about what they're looking at so they can be a little bit critical of what they're, what they're seeing. I have a question. Yes? For um, it is, are the kidneys involved virtually none with alcohol except taking out water? You want to answer? Certainly the, there's, there's diminishingly small amounts of, uh, of elimination that would happen through the kidneys if that's your question. Yeah. So, so bulk of elimination is going to happen through the process of metabolism that is, and most of that happens in the liver. Okay. Because that's where the enzymes are, sort of hearkening back to, to the conversation we had last week. Uh, other questions about the circulation? Okay, so let's move on to uh, ethanol dissolved in the blood is distributed to the organs around the body and it's a very volatile molecule. Um, what are some of the chemical and physical properties that contribute to this volatility? And again, this is basically review from our conversation. Oh, I wanted to mention this. Let me back up a little bit. So um, also in that, in that first question, of course, we, would, um, we, we were in diagramming the path that ethanol would take um, from the gut back up to the lungs. We do want to make sure that, that we mention things and have opportunities to mention things like the different cell types involved here, crossing an epithelial barrier into the interstitial space, entering the capillary, through um, endothelial cells. All of this, again, review from, from last week. Let me jump ahead. Okay, so vaporization. What are some of the, the chemical and, and physical properties of ethanol that contribute to this vaporization in the lungs? And again, as a review from last week, this is gonna look familiar to you. We said that one of the most important things contributing to volatility between these two molecules is how many hydrogen bonds each one of them can make with neighboring molecules in their liquid form. And so less hydrogen bonds translates into less energy needed to break those bonds and release these molecules from their liquid form, it, it, ethanol, from its liquid form into a gaseous state. Now that goes right along with the idea that uh, molecules with low boiling points tend to be more volatile than molecules with higher boiling points. And so that works because water boils at what temperature? 100 yeah, 100 degrees Celsius and ethanol at 78.5. So just to introduce a little, um, a little twister here, a, a little mind bender, there turns out that there is another molecule that has the same, um, the same number of atoms and the, and the same atoms as ethanol, but they're connected up in a different configuration. And so based on the idea of um, hydrogen bonding, uh, I wonder if someone would like to take a stab at uh, this molecule, by the way, is called methoxymethane. You'll see just the connectivity is different because the electronegative oxygen now is squeezed between these two methyl groups. And uh, so what about the connectivity here would predict volatility? Anyone want to take a stab at which one of these molecules is more volatile and why? Based on our, okay, who am I talking to? South Carolina. Oh, great. Let's hear from South Carolina. The, key, the ketone, the, you have to have the hydrogen attached to the oxygen to have a hydrogen bond. Great. And so there's no hydrogen attached to the oxygen. And so that's a, a very nonpolar molecule in all respects because it's very symmetrical, so it has no attraction great. to itself. Great. So she brought up two points, and one is that, uh, that you need the hydrogen attached to the very electronegative uh, oxygen and, and it, it, in order to make the hydrogen bond. So no hydrogen bonding here. And then in addition to that, what, in addition to that, she mentioned symmetry of the molecule. So I think that's also important. So yeah, it turns out that, uh, that ethanol boils at 100 degrees Celsius and methoxymethane at minus 24. So a very, very volatile molecule in comparison. Same atoms, just different connectivity. 
Okay, so that, that takes us through the first couple of uh, questions here, I think. You're going to get this in, in Oh, by the way, I see that some of you are sort of furiously writing, and you could be writing anything, but just in case you're trying to take these notes down, they're actually part of the curriculum that's going to be featured heavily next week. Um, Shelly's going to spend some time walking through the curriculum, and all of these um, figures are part of what you'll be getting inside the curriculum. So no need to, uh, to copy all the intimate details of this down. Hey, on that slide, you have the the ethanol boils at a hundred, but oh, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. That's an error. I sorry. It's seventy eight point five. Thanks. And so, what you're telling me is the molecule on the right boils more. I mean, it vaporizes more easily or less easily? More. More. Much more easily. It, it has it has no um, it, it doesn't have the same hydrogen bonds that would help it to stay in the oh, liquid okay. form. Got it. Holding got it in it, the liquid it, form. Okay. Any other questions about this just basic concept before we move on? Is that better? Thanks. Seventy. It's actually seventy-eight point five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's closer. Close, but no cigar. Sorry. Okay, so let's move forward, and this is where I'd like to solicit some more um, participation from the audience to a, to a concept that's, um, that's somewhat difficult, especially at the high school level, and um, we frequently find that um, students have misconceptions about the definition of equilibrium. So moving forward, if the breathalyzer can approximate a person's blood alcohol concentration because the alcohol vapor in the lungs is directly related to the concentration um, of alcohol in the blood. And once it gets into the lungs, an equilibrium is achieved between the concentration of alcohol in the lungs and that concentration of alcohol in the blood. What, by definition, is meant um, when we say equilibrium? Does someone want to describe in their own words what is meant by equilibrium and whether sure, there are still molecules that. moving? Thank you. Yes, there would be molecules moving even due to uh, Brownian motion. The idea is that in equilibrium, there are the same number of molecules moving one direction as the other. So there's no net gain of movement in equilibrium, but there is still constant motion and movement across the membranes. Oh, great. So, that, so that's a great answer. And, and I think the main goal here is that we have lots of students that leave the classroom um, thinking that an equilibrium means um, that maybe even the same number of molecules are on both sides of the membrane. But the important point is, as I think Gail mentioned, was that the net movement of molecules between two compartments, here the blood and the lungs, and we're shown an animation here, molecules in motion, the middle arrow here, I hope you guys can all see this, is net flow, and each of the other arrows indicates flow of molecules in both directions. At equilibrium, the net flow becomes zero. Any questions about this? And then I think if as we want to show it one, one more as time, as or you you're exhale. getting ready to exhale. Okay, as you exhale then, what happens to the system? It shifts. <laughs> you sure. no longer have equilibrium. Sure, you know, for that instantaneous Shift. moment, it's almost as if you were starting over again with everything in the blood and nothing in the lung compartment. And so for that instantaneous moment, there's nothing here. And of course, now the, the movement of, of molecules is going to be all in one direction until you again get the net flow back to zero. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about this concept? Uh, can I just rephrase one thing? All of the movement, the net movement, is in one direction at the beginning of exhalation. Right. Not all the movement. Does, do you guys see the difference? Yes. Okay, there are still molecules moving against the concentration gradient, but very, very few of them. Well, if, if we are, I got a question. If we're constantly, you know, inhaling and exhaling and equilibrium takes time, are we ever actually at equilibrium in that area, or is it constantly changing? If you take it down to the split equilibrium. second, it's constantly changing. But over you know, a several-minute period, we can, we can call it an equilibrium. And in fact, 
The alcohol is in equilibrium with all of your tissues in your body for a certain amount of time and until you start um, getting down to such a low concentration of alcohol in your blood that you're able to metabolize it very quickly. So you know, first you, you take the alcohol in and it takes a little bit of while for that equilibrium to be established, but once you get to your peak blood alcohol levels, everything's in equilibrium for some time. But in theory, if you want to take it down to the millisecond, yes. In practice, we don't really say that the equilibrium is changing constantly. Okay. And the movement between these two compartments, of course, is schematized in this, in this one drawing as if we were looking at the bloodstream in a single air sac. But of course, all of this is going to be averaged out over those millions of air sacs that you have in your lungs. So again, you know, this might be a snapshot in one alveolar um, sac, but of course the average is what you're going to be measuring when you measure the breathalyzer test. Additional questions about equilibrium? Okay, so moving right along. Uh, when a person exhales into the a breath analyzer, such as the breathalyzer tube, the exhaled oxygen then reacts with compounds inside the breathalyzer chamber and produces a color change. That color change happens to be uh, orange to green inside this particular trademark breathalyzer um, uh, test. So in that equation, which I'm sure some of you came across, I'm going to give it away. Let's start here. What is oxidized and what is reduced? And I just wanted to, I was going to fill in the first half because what I was going to say is it should be review that the thing that gets oxidized is the ethanol because we spent some time last week discussing the fact that ethanol is oxidized um, uh, or is metabolized in uh, uh, two different oxidation reactions, two steps, and the first being ethanol to acetaldehyde and the second being acetaldehyde to acetic acid and a byproduct of that reaction being water. So we know that ethanol gets oxidized to acetic acid. So what is it that gets reduced in this reaction? Did anybody find that out? Uh, the, it's a dichromate. Um, we're actually reducing the indicator molecule. Okay. Do we have input from someone in Texas? I thought I heard someone. I just said the chromium is being reduced. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. And so this is a... a can't really step out of the way enough. I should have shrunk this a bit. So this is just a schematic of that. Can't hear you. Move by the bike. <laughs> So I'm standing in front of a lovely schematic of the chemical reaction, and in a minute when I move, I think what we'll do at this point is stop and actually do a hands-on breathalyzer um, uh, demonstration or experiment there, uh, and Myra will be leading us in the, uh, in the uh, activity. You guys want to play with this? All right. Everybody should have a bag of goodies. Right? So what I'd like you to do is to pull... All right. So if you open your Ziploc bag... What you have in your Ziploc bag is a pipette, and then you, then you have the alcohol that's stored inside the, the test tube here. So you might want to have one person open that, another one have the pipette, and somebody else has a balloon. Okay? Uh, before we... Um, well, let's go ahead and do it, and then we'll come back and talk about it. So what you need to do is to maybe stretch your balloon first so you know you can blow it up. Am I, are we all supposed to have Should be one for every couple of people. Okay? Then you have a, a barrel pipette, and you want to take just a couple of drops is all it takes of the alcohol and put in the balloon. Okay? All right, 
and then blow that up. Okay, you got a balloon that you've blown up. Now twist it at the mouth. Okay, and once you <laughs> now you can blow up the balloon. And now you need a piece of the parafilm. They're working much slower than yours. Yeah. They're not, they're not even close to it. Yes. Okay. And, and what was the parafilm? All right, hold up. The parafilm is going to be our tape. So you've got the balloon blown up and you've twisted it. See, right here we've twisted it. And that's so that you can manipulate the ends and not let all the air out. But you've got alcohol in here. You also, you know, are going to warm that up a little bit just by rubbing it so you know that the alcohol, the two drops of alcohol you put in here vaporize. Now take the pipette and put in the mouth of the balloon. So see how I've got it right here? Okay. You can go. That's okay. Okay. All right. Then take your parafilm, and we're going to use it kind of like scotch tape. We have the sticky end coming up here. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're going to have to tie this. There's another, there's another pipe down. I think you need one more. Okay, and you want to wrap. Oh, wow. Here's our pipe down. You're going to wrap the parafilm so you'll hold the balloon on the top of the pipette. Okay? And that parafilm will stretch and stretch. Yeah, you're, you're putting it on the big end, not the little end. Now, once you do that, then you can untwist it and let the air and the vaporized alcohol go into here. So now we've got our breath. Give me that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the... The way I made the, the um, pipettes is I just had a big container of the silica gel, you know, the silicon that you use in chromatography. So I took a bunch of that and I put it in a container and I put a solution of acidified dichromate. Now when you go to the Moodle site, you will see two Word documents. One of them says breathalyzer activity, and the other one says Beer's Law activity. So if you have a handout that tells you exactly how to make this, even with some pictures of the little twisty thing that I figured out how to do that by myself so I could do it as a demonstration. Okay. Now, as you've figured out, it's much easier with two people making it work. But the dichromate is actually a liquid. It looks like yeah. this. Oh, it's sort of an orangish color. Okay. Um, and you just put it in the silica uh, gel, pour out the excess, and then let it dry overnight. And then uh, you can take a small amount, and you can see it doesn't take much. Okay. And this is a qualitative method. And I put the cotton in the bottom and the cotton in the top just to keep it from sloshing around. You need to put the cotton in the bottom. You don't have to put the... The other, the other thing that, and playing around with this, um, I found, you, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but at, here at our high school, sometimes uh, people donate uh, surplus uh, materials. And someone had donated a bunch of these uh, silica gel SIOH little columns, like chromatography columns. And so I took one of those and just saturated it with the dichromate, and it would work just as well as doing the making your own silica gel. Um, also, you don't really have to have the silica in there at all. The only reason for that is to have a medium that's not going to slosh around. You could actually take a test tube take the balloon and bubble. You might want to use a pipette and have a small amount of bubbling. You could actually bubble the alcohol in there and it will turn uh, a nice green color.